Okay. So this is the first real lecture of the linear programming course. The first two lectures were devoted to reviews of linear algebra. So if you have any you know, issues with the linear algebra, you know, by all means, you know, listen to those lectures, look at your books, feel free to talk to me. What we're going to do now is we're going to start getting into the heart of the subject, linear programming. But I thought before we get into the heart of the subject, I thought it would be worthwhile to spend a few minutes talking about why do we study linear algebra? You know, what kind of problems does linear algebra help us solve? And then, of course, this leads naturally to, well, what problems does linear algebra not solve? And so one way to go from that is into linear programming, but there are other ways to go as well. So there's lots of different uh, things we can do. So I think probably one of the earliest applications, so applications of linear algebra. And I actually used this on a job interview. I have to be a little bit careful because I'm being interviewed. I don't know if you, I mean, you know, I'm being recorded. But I was at a job interview years ago at a big Wall Street firm, and I was told that my lunch with somebody from Human Resources would not count as part of the interview. And it turns out that they had been an art history major in college. Can I talk to somebody for half an hour to an hour intelligently about art when I'm a Philistine and for the most part hate it? Sure. You know, I was a you know, I undergraduate at Yale, I have a liberal arts background, I've taught at liberal arts schools. For 30 minutes to an hour, I can always, you know, work my way through. How does linear algebra occur in art? Well, perspectives. You know, trying to figure out where you should put people, how big they should be. And so one of my famous artists uh, is Eakins. And they didn't know, anybody here know Eakins? So my wife and I were given sorry, my wife and I were given membership to the Philadelphia Museum of Art, and I saw a nice exhibit of his. And he was an 1800s American painter, and it turns out that what he had done is he had taken photographs of people and he had projected them onto the canvas and put little dots so that he would know exactly what size to make them to be the correct scale relative to their surroundings without having to go through the long and painful process. And so. He would have been in trouble if the art world had discovered he was doing this back then. And it was only discovered you know, decades later when somebody found a photograph in some old woman's attic of four people in the exact same pose and exact same clothing as one of his you know, beach pictures. And so one really nice application is to art problems like this. Is to figure out you know, how should you get the perspectives correct. Okay, so this is one application. A second application is an error correction detection codes. So I'm not going to go in too much detail into these subjects. I just want you to have a sense of where else could you go in linear algebra. And so one of the big things is you want to be able to transmit information fast and efficiently from one place to another. And so we typically send information with strings of zeros and ones. is, what happens if we receive one of the bits incorrectly? You, know, you don't want the whole message to be corrupted because of one transmission error. So if transmission errors are rare, one way around this is to send 0, 0, 0 for 0, send 1, 1, 1 for 1. If transition errors are rare, If you get 0, 1, 0, what was intended? So if it's very weird to make an error, and I say I'm only going to send 0, 0, 0, or 1, 1, 1, mm -hmm. and you receive 0, 1, 0, what was the probable message? 0. Almost was it 0? But, but you have the probability for... I'm just saying, assume it's very weird to make an error. And in most things, it's very weird for a data bit to be corrupted. Mm -hmm. So if you were told you're either going to get 0, 0, 0, or 1, 1, 1, and you happen to get 0, 1, 0, what would you guess was the intended message? 1. 0, 0, 0. 0, 0, 0, the first message. Right? The probability of making a 1-bit error would be like P 
two bits being wrong and this being 111 would be p squared. And so it's far more likely that 0, 0, 0 was meant. The problem with this is only 33% is information. You know, two thirds of our message is redundancy. This was instituted by a brilliant man named Hammock, who used to work at Bell Labs. And you know, as you will all be when you leave Mount Polio, you will be low person on the totem pole. And when he was low person on the totem pole, he only had access to the computer on the weekends. And this was the days of punch cards. So you know, you're trying to get out of programming. So he would give them his punch cards, and they would try to run the program on the weekend, and they would run the program until the computer crashed. And then they would tell him, your program crashed on line 15. And there would be a small mistake. And he would have to wait a week before it would run again. And then they would tell him, your program crashed on line 23. And he'd have to wait a week again. And he exclaimed in exasperation with cleaned up language since this is being recorded, if the blooming computer can detect I've made an error, why can't it correct my error? And so this led him to create error correcting codes. And so this is one way to do it, but it's extremely inefficient. Two thirds of the message is redundancy. Hamming came up with a way such that over 50% of the message is actually information, and it can still correct an error. And so it's absolutely amazing what you can do. And if you're interested in stuff like this, I have you know, handouts. The way you implement a lot of this coding and decoding is through matrices. And so that's a great, great application of linear algebra. All right, so what else do we have from linear algebra? I just wanna... <coughs> so there's you know, the, the Fourier transform and signal process. So, anybody who's done any work in engineering knows how great the Fourier transform is. And so there's lots of different applications from that. Another possibility, since some of you are stats or took probability with me, is the method of least squares. A lot of times in math, what we study is not necessarily the most natural thing, but the easiest thing for us to study. And so the method of least squares, I'll write it down for trying to find the best fit line, but you can generalize this to other relations. Let's say you have a conjecture relation y equals ax plus b, and you want to find the best values of a and b. You can create many different error functions, and one good error function is the sum k goes 1 to n if you have data points, of the observed value minus the predicted value. And we'll square the error. If I didn't square the error, then positive and negative errors could cancel. And you could get the ridiculous situation where if you want to find the best fit line through these two points, this would be the best fit line, because this error would cancel with that error. So clearly you don't want to do square, don't, you don't want to just do it without a square. Why not take absolute values? Well, if you take absolute values, calculus is not applicable. And so calculus is extremely powerful, and by using squares, the power of calculus is available. And so using squares, if we look at dA, dE dA equals zero, dE dB equals zero, this gives us a system of linear equations to solve. And now we're in the situation of linear algebra. So by using the square, we get calculus and linear algebra. So already by your sophomore year, you've got all the tools you need for one of the most important problems. It turns out, if I made this x cubed, it wouldn't affect the analysis significantly. All that matters is that it's linear in the unknown parameters. If you have a relationship that's maybe not linear in the initial parameters, maybe you believe the gravitational force is m1 m2 over r to some power d. Well, what you can do is you can do a change of variables. And if you look at logs, the log of f is d log of r, or negative d log r, plus the log of m1, m2. And now we have a linear relationship in terms of these two new variables. And so a lot of relations that do not initially look linear can be linearized very nicely. So this is again an enormous application. If you're interested, I have notes on the method of these squares already written up. Okay, 
we'll do just one or two more applications of linear algebra to just convince you that you spent your time well taking a linear algebra class. And then we'll move on to what linear algebra can't do. So this is difference equations. So you know, the Fibonacci is fn plus 2 is fn plus 1 plus fn. And I gave you maybe f of 0 is 0, f of 1 is 1. How many of you have not seen difference equations before? Okay, how many of you know how to solve difference equations like this? Alright, there's several ways to solve it. One way is the method of divine inspiration, which I'm not going to go through right now because this is a class on linear algebra and linear programming. I'm going to show you the linear programming, actually the linear algebra way to solve this. Let's let Vn be Fn, Fn minus 1. So we agree that once we specify two values, all the terms in the sequence are uniquely determined, because each term depends only on the previous two. The question is, we don't want to have to go through one term at a time to figure out what the 2012 term is. That would be painful. We'd like to just jump to the 2012 term. And so I'm going to show how you would solve this using linear algebra, and then I'll show you a nice application to um, either Star Trek IV or rabbit populations, depending on your point of view. Let's look at Vn plus 1. I claim there is a matrix such that this equation is true. Well, let's think. Vn plus 1 is Fn plus 1 Fn. Well, fn plus 1 is fn plus fn minus 1, right? And this is where it's going to be really nice on that blackboard. I can rewrite this. I'm going to rewrite this by moving the minus 1 to here and moving this over. And write it as fn minus 1 plus fn. This is a much better way to write it. And I can write this as a matrix now, 1, 1, 0, 1. Oh no, sorry. Um, I'm sorry, the way I'm doing my notation, I had it the right way initially. I apologize. Um, I want it as fn plus fn minus 1. fn, we'll see if anybody notices that there's a minute clip deleted from the video. This is 1, 1, 1, 0. fn, fn minus 1. You have your choice as to whether or not you put the large index on top or on the bottom. And that will change the matrix in a small way. So this is my matrix A. Vn plus 1 is A times Vn. But now we can do one of the most important techniques in all of mathematics. The lather, rinse, repeat technique. I love this technique. It's wonderful. Right? <laughs> Vn plus 1 is A Vn. But what is Vn? A, B, N minus 1. So that's A squared, B, N minus 1. So blah, 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 it equals A to some power times B1. And now the question is always, well, what's that power supposed to be? Well, I notice the power here is 1 plus N is N plus 1. 2 plus this is N plus 1. So the power here is going to be N. I always have trouble counting down as to what's the power of the matrix supposed to be. So if I play this little game, I always remember. So the n plus 1 term is just the matrix of the nth power times v1. So if you know how to find high powers of a matrix, this is where you use diagonalization. Diagonalize. Eigenvectors. Eigenvectors. This allows you to have a closed form expression for the n plus first term in the sequence. So you don't have to go through all the intermediate terms. You figure out the linear combination you need of the eigenvectors in the initial conditions. And so what we'll do is we express V1 in terms of the two eigenvectors of this matrix, and then the solution will just involve high powers. And so what you would end up getting is the solution would be something like if W1 and W2 are the eigenvectors with eigenvalues lambda 1, lambda 2, 
then you get V1 is C1 W1, plus C2 W2. So you solve for those coefficients C1 and C2. And then you get Vn plus 1 is just A to the N V1. So it's C1 lambda 1 to the N uh, W1 plus C2 lambda 2 to the N W2. And voila. Here's a nice way to solve in closed form a difference equation. Difference equations are discrete forms of differential equations. And so this gives you an idea of why they're so important to study. And so the example we gave was the example of the Fibonacci numbers. There's lots of other examples we could look at. And so I think the example I gave in my probability class, I think we looked at whale population. Is that right? So we looked at whales. And so you, know, you can imagine you have a population of whales, and since this is a first round model, we will assume an unrealistic set of rules about whales. Whales live in four years, give birth to one pair of new calves in. Two give birth to two pair of new calves in year three, and then they live for a year and then they die. So we'll let a n be the number of whales born in year n. We'll let b n be the number of whales. One year old in year n. Cn will be the number of whales two years old in year n. And then dn is the number of whales that are three years old in year n. And we can basically set up a very similar equation to what we had before. What's the equation for a n? How many whales, I'm oh, sorry, a n plus 1. So how many whales are born in year n plus 1? Well, anybody who was 1 year old in year n will then give birth. Um, so this is where I always have to spend a minute to figure out, you know, with the notation we're using, how do we denote it? So the ones that are being born in year n plus 1, I think they're coming from the ones who are one year old in year n. So I think that's going to just be vn plus v2cn. I think the way we would change notation. If this is a little bit off, we then just fix these numbers a little bit. It might be better to have the wheels live six years old and don't give birth for the first two years and have a few years to enjoy being grandparents. You know, you can adjust the problem a little bit. Uh, how many wheels in year n plus one? Are they that are exactly one year old? Well, that's all the wheels that were born the previous year. And then CN plus one is all the wheels that were one year younger in the previous year. DN plus one is going to be CN. And you can put this into matrix form just like the previous problem. And you can solve it just like the previous problem. And then one of the things we talked about in our probability class, and this is a way to generalize linear algebra, is this is absurd, right? The wheels are not going to give birth to exactly one pair, you know. They're not going to all make it to four years. You would really want to put random numbers in here, drawn from some distribution with a reasonable mean, a reasonable decay, something like that, and then simulate what would happen. But the underlying simple model is a linear algebra problem. Okay, um, I think this is a good number of problems from linear algebra to try to convince us that linear algebra is useful. The question then is, what comes beyond linear algebra? Well, there's several ways to go. Linear algebra deals with finding solutions to linear equations, to systems of linear equations. So one possibility is to consider nonlinear systems.
So, the following was motivated by a question my son asked me. Uh, he wanted to know how our GPS system worked. Right? How many of you know how GPS systems work? Alright, so we'll at least learn something today. So, if you have a good imagination, this is the middle of the car. Okay? And we're trying to figure out where we are. And so there's a bunch of satellites in various positions about the Earth. And so there's lots of stuff written on how GPS works. I'm going to just give you one set of approach, one approach to trying to understand how a GPS system would work. Imagine each of these satellites sends out a message saying it's 12 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0 for right now. Well, we know how fast light is. We know how fast light travels. So when that message reaches us, and we know what time it is at us, we know how far it's traveled. So we know how far we are from this point. So what that means is we live on some giant sphere of a given radius about this point. Okay? Mm -hmm. And so, rather than trying to figure out exactly what's going on in the three-dimensional case, let's try first the two-dimensional case. It's a little bit easier, I think, to fathom. So imagine, here's our first satellite, and we know we're given distance from it. So when we're somewhere over here, so we can almost figure out where we are. Now imagine we know how far we are from another satellite. That's correctly. Unfortunately, there's an indeterminacy. We could be in one of two places. Now, if these places are very far apart, probably we can guess okay. Given that I was in Massachusetts you know, two hours ago, I'm probably not in California right now. We could probably figure out where we are. But if the distances happen to be very close, and you know, we've turned off the GPS for a little bit, then we're not so sure. So two data points is not quite enough to determine where we are. So what would we need? A third. And in fact, if there are some errors or uncertainties in the measurements, then you can use method of least squares to try to predict where you should be and to clean things up. And of course, in, you know, three-dimensional world, we need, I think, four satellites to uniquely determine where we are. And so this is one way that GPS works, is trying to solve these equations. And these are not going to be linear equations, because they're involving you know, squares involving distances. So this is one of many generalizations of linear algebra, is you know, trying to tackle problems like this. So a big, big question is optimization. So anybody here who has you know, econ somewhere on their transcript, you know, this is a huge field, trying to find the optimal way to do something if you're running a business. You know, what's the cheapest way? How do you maximize profits? And this is where linear programming really kicks in. So one of the ways to generalize linear algebra is to go to nonlinear equations. And so I gave you know, one example with trying to solve where we are from the satellites. There's many more examples. Um, you know, if people are interested, I'll write it off some more at some other point. That's one way, which makes sense, right? Going from having linear equations to nonlinear equations. Natural generalization. Here is another generalization. Generalizing linear algebra to linear programming. We go from solving ax equals b to maximize x transpose c subject to ax equals b. This is another natural generalization to linear algebra. I'm keeping my equations linear, but now I'm putting in an objective function. And here, you should regard A 
B and C as known. And the goal is to find X. If you think of C as known, this is going to be a linear equation. It's going to be C1, X1, plus C2, X2, plus dot, 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 plus C and X n. So we're trying to maximize a linear function. The constraints are all going to be linear constraints. So you know, this explains the word fragment lim, you know, the linear and linear programming. Now, of course, the question is, which systems of interest can actually be set up like this? Is it possible to solve systems like this? How long does it take to solve something like this? And so a lot of problems, if every subatomic particle in the universe was a universe, where every subatomic particle was a supercomputer devoted exclusively to your use, and running continuously since the universe began, working on some of these problems, that would not be enough computer power to solve some of the problems we have in everyday real world applications. So this is one of the big jumps you have to make from a lot of the standard math classes. Originally, what you do is you have a known problem, you know, a known model, an exact model, and you want an exact answer. Then you might have an exact problem and you look for an approximate answer, or an approximate model and you look for an exact answer. Here we're going to have an approximate model and look for an approximate answer. You know, in general, for the real world problems. It's too hard to solve some of these problems in a reasonable amount of time. Imagine you own American Airlines. Okay, so who's my, who are my econ people? Was it just person? Yeah, okay, okay, you two are both here. What is your goal as the CEO of American Airlines? Um, to stop bankruptcy. <laughs> <laughs> close, so close, that's extremely close. <laughs> What's your goal? Um, maximize the number of guests on a certain flight. I don't know, make sure that... No, 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 no. Make no. sure that airplanes don't crash. No, no, that, that's, <laughs> not, that's not your goal. What is your goal as the CEO of American Airlines? Do you mean in operation or like... You own American Airlines. It's yours. Congratulations. So, so your question is like... How to improve the operation or No. What's your goal? What's your objective? As a yes. Maximize, maximize profit. <laughs> right? If you pack people in like sardines, if you charge them for shipping their luggage and they don't complain enough, it's a good thing, right? Your goal is to make money. Now, how do you make money? Packing people in like sardines and charging them for luggage may not be a good long-term strategy. And so you have to weigh these things. But your goal as CEO of American Airlines is to make money. Now, how do you make money? You fly people from city to city, right? This means you have to predict what the demand is going to be months ahead of time from Hartford, Connecticut to Washington, D.C., a flight I did, or Albany, New York to Rochester, New York. And so if you can find an efficient way to allocate your flights among your planes, you'll make more money. You also have restrictions. If a, if a plane is being used to fly from Hartford to D.C., you can't simultaneously use it for Denver to L.A. There's also regulations. Once a plane has landed, the crew sometimes needs a certain amount of downtime before they can fly another flight. So you have all these constraints you want to work in. These constraints are going to come into the AX equals B. Some of these constraints are going to be physical constraints, such as a plane cannot be used simultaneously for two different routes. Some of them will be governmental constraints. Uh, there's a new governmental constraint I just learned about where they made some elementary school kids eat chicken McNuggets because they were not happy with the lunches their parents had. Okay, how many, I see you shaking your head. How many of you have heard of the story? They actually forced you know, some five-year-olds to eat chicken McNuggets because they were unhappy with the lunch the parents packed. There could be governmental constraints coming in here, and these could be good, they could be bad. There's two types of constraints. Some of these constraints we may want to satisfy if possible, but may, we may allow ourselves to violate them. So for instance, a lot of companies will engage in, shall we say, shady practices, questionable practices, and you know, if the cost of being caught is high, but the probability is small, it might be worthwhile to risk it. And so you want to have your model flexible enough to allow you to do things like that. We'll see how to do that very easily. 
where we can set up constraints where we want them to be satisfied, but we'll allow them to be violated if the profit is enough. And so a huge thing is to try to optimize situations like this. And it turns out there's a lot of problems that can be formulated where we have a set of constraints like this, and trying to find the optimal solution is not feasible in the amount of time we have. But what is feasible is getting close to the optimal. So imagine I tell you it will take 15 trillion years for me to tell American Airlines what schedule they should run next week. Will American Airlines wait 15 trillion years? No. What if I tell them I can be within $12,000 in two hours time? Mm -hmm. It's not going to be optimal. I'll be off by $12,000 at most. Does American Airlines care? No. no. If you're within $12,000 in two hours' time, that's information that's usable. You can then use this to allocate your resources. And so for a lot of these problems, just getting close to the right answer in a reasonable amount of time is all we need to do. The other thing, of course, is we don't really know how many people want to go from Hartford to DC on a given day. So the numbers we're putting into the model are a little bit suspect already. So to insist on the model solving itself, you know, I, I have you know, some issues with that because we don't necessarily know if the numbers are correct. Now there are other problems where we do know the numbers are correct. And we'll talk about like the traveling salesman problem. Uh, actually, let's talk about the traveling salesman problem. Yeah, it's a fun problem. How many of you have heard of the traveling salesman? So TSL. Traveling salesman. You have a bunch of cities. Alright, say something like this. And your goal as, goal as the salesman is to visit each city. What do you think you're trying to maximize or minimize? Minimize the cost. Okay, well, and cost would be time here. Okay. You want to minimize the time spent traveling, because time you spend traveling is time not selling things. And so not all cities might be connected. Mm -hmm. And so the question is, what is the optimal route to go through the network? So, do you think an optimal route exists? Sure. Mm -hmm. How many possible routes are there? We can probably say that there's a finite number of routes we have to check. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. You know, maybe we'll go through some cities multiple times, but if there's end cities, maybe there's at most end to the end routes or something like that. Mm -hmm. Right? You know, worst case scenario, I go here, I don't know. Maybe it's not end to the end. That, that's a good homework problem. Homework problem. If you want, and no, there's an option on Give a finite bound on the number of cities. I'm sorry, number of paths to check. Assume. City I is connected to city J. So that you can always get from any city to any city. So this map would not satisfy that because I can't get from this city to this city. But assume all cities are connected so you can always go from one city to another. You should be able to show there's only finitely many cities you need to look at in order to make sure that you've gone into you know, every city at least once. So all we have to do, and this is a big all, is list all possible paths in this finite set and see which one has the shortest time. Mm -hmm. This is where the heat death of the universe occurs numerous times over. It's not practical to list this all out. We need an efficient way to go through something like this. And that's the power of linear programming, is it finds efficient ways to go through stuff like this. Another really nice application of linear programming is to the Kepler conjecture. How many of you have heard of the Kepler conjecture? It actually beats from our last theorem. Um, so 
So it's older than Fermat's last theorem, and it was proved after Fermat's last theorem. So if you want a theorem that's long, you know, this one, this one beats Fermat. And what it basically says is, imagine you have a bunch of cannonballs, and you want to know what's the most efficient way to pack them in a three-dimensional space. So we're basically concerned with packing circles. This turns out to be connected with error-correcting codes I was talking about earlier. There's lots of wonderful connections between the mathematics of sphere packing, high-dimensional lattices, and error-correcting codes. Let's do the one-dimensional case. What does a circle or a sphere look like in one dimension? A line. Oh, a line. A line segment. Like a line, yeah. So it's really not that hard to pack circles efficiently on a line. Right? Two dimensions. It turns out the best way to do this is basically a hexagonal packing. I'm not going to be able to do this time. Oh, please. But basically, you know, the centers of the circle or you, you know, form a, he a hexagon. And then you just continue and extend this pattern. This turns out to be the best in three dimensions. And now two dimensions. And really, you know, what's going on is there's a hexagon over here. In three dimensions, what was conjectured is what you do is you take these layers of hexagons and in the valleys over here, you put the mountains from the next level. And it was conjectured that that was the best way to do it. And it was a monumental achievement when Hales and his student Ferguson finally proved this. And a big part of their proof was actually reducing the problem to a linear programming problem. In breaking up all the different cases they had to look at to various things to try to optimize what's the best packing volume they could have, what percent of three-dimensional space will different packings get. And so linear programming was actually essential in this proof. And the mathematical community was not quite sure how to handle a proof where computation was so important. And it has caused a huge controversy in the field. And in fact, the proof was published in two parts, in a CS environment and in a math environment, in one of the top math journals. And I believe the math journal had a little asterisk saying, we say nothing about whether or not the program is correct because we're not checking the code. And so Heels has now, because of how his proof was received, is now very interested in automated proof theory and having computers devise proof certificates for mathematical results. And this is a very important question as we're entering the 21st century. Do you trust a proof where a good chunk of it was the computer searching and saying, there's no answer better than this? Versus, do you trust a professor not to make a mistake in a hundred lines of arguments? You know, both methods have their dangers. So let's talk a little bit more about you know, types of problems that linear programming can solve. And so, we should at least end the first day with one good optimization problem. So this is the diet problem. So, right now, uh, I guess, if any, uh, I'm, not, I'm not going to worry right now about making sure that the, note, that the notation here matches what's in my notes, because I've already written up what's in my notes. I need two food products. Two things people like to eat. Chocolate. Chocolate. Oh. <laughs> and what else do people like to eat? Ice cream. Ice cream. Oh, this is going to be a fun class. So I will tell the math department that we need chocolate and ice cream, because uh, we need to actually have real-world applications. Okay. <laughs> so I need two nutrients. <laughs> Sugar and fat. <laughs> All right. You have to speak up. You don't speak? Okay. So you need a certain amount of sugar and fat each day or you will die. And so in order to prevent that catastrophe from happening, we will eat lots of chocolate and ice cream. Right, let's say chocolate, you know, one unit of chocolate has two units of sugar 
and four units of fat. And one unit of ice cream has one unit of sugar and five units of fat. And how much does chocolate cost per unit? What unit? A unit. <laughs> three. Three? At three dollars per unit, how much does ice cream cost per unit? Five for a good one. How much? Five. Five dollars a unit. Okay. Ice cream is expensive. Okay. So what we want to do is we want to make sure we get enough sugar and fat each day to survive. And so if we let x1 equal the amount of chocolate we consume, and we let x2 equal the amount of ice cream we consume, what do you think our goal is? Maximize the total nutrients given a budget. Okay, very clear. Maximize is not quite the right word here. We will, you're, you're close. Do you have an optimal amount of sugar and fats that we want to consume? Well, we, we need. Oh, did, I, did, I didn't list that. Sorry. Ah, uh, so that's important information. Because you don't want to. Recommend so daily sugar. allowance. <laughs> we need ten units of sugar. 14 units of chocolate a day to live. Anything less than we die. This is actually not far from the truth. This is how I'm able to stay up until about 2 a.m. most nights working on math. Usually it's MMs. Alright, so we need a certain amount of chocolate, so, I'm sorry, a certain amount of sugar, a certain amount of fat, or we die. So what do you think we're trying to optimize? The cost. The cost. And so what we want to do is we want to find a diet that keeps us alive as cheaply as possible. So the cost is going to be 3x1 plus 5x2. And we want to make this as small as possible subject to us staying alive. And so I'll move this over a little bit. So ice cream is five dollars. And what number is that? I think I'll one and five. And the idea Alright, so give me all the equations you can think of that we need to satisfy to keep ourselves alive. 2x1 plus x2. 2x1 plus 1 times x2. Larger than or equal to 10. Good, greater than 10. And I'm just writing the 1 over here to just remind us that it's coming from the 1. Right? We have to have at least this much. Um, of sugar or we die. What else? Okay. Okay, so we go. Minimize. Three x one plus five x two. Subject to the above. Okay, if this was a real class, we would all think. Mm -hmm. You're missing two equations. So there's two physical equations, there's two more relations among x1 and x2 that you've missed. Oh, it's, it's one positive. has to be greater than zero. Yes! x1 is greater than equal to zero, x2 is greater than equal to zero. Otherwise, um, if you forgive the image, Right before dinner, I could regurgitate ice cream, make money for regurgitating ice cream, right? I'm not allowed to eat negative amounts of ice cream, right? One possibility might be to eat, well, you know, ice cream is kind of expensive. What if I give back some ice cream, right? That's not an option. I want to find the diet that will keep me alive, and I have these physical conditions. X1 is greater than equal to zero, X2 is greater than equal to zero. Yes. Do they have to be integers? So that's a good question. Uh, in some problems, they have to be integers, and that makes it a lot harder. So, for instance, um, you might have to buy an entire chocolate bar, or an entire uh, pint of ice cream. And if you have something like that, then you have to do integer amounts. Or you might have the ability of, you, know, you have the chocolate spigot, and you can then take exactly how much chocolate you want. 
And so that makes a great problem. You have a huge difference in integer or real. It's much easier to solve integer programming problems if the outputs are allowed to be any real number. For a lot of scheduling issues, things unfortunately have to be uh, integers. So in the next class, we'll actually solve the diet problem in detail. Okay. What I want to do is I want to give one more motivating example of why we care about linear programming, and then give you a homework problem to think about. I know the solution to this problem, I think, is in the notes for the chapter, but I still want to just you know, pose it. Right. Any question about the diet problem? In the real world, of course, we have more than two products, we have more than two nutrients. Right? This is an extremely important problem in many world economic systems, where they're trying to figure out how to allocate their resources in terms of what crops they grow. So, we can do airlines, we can do movie theaters, um, we can do Major League Baseball schedules. Anybody have a preference? Movie theaters? Yes. Yeah. Right. So you own a movie theater now. It's your lucky day. American Airlines is expanding. So now you've bought a movie theater. What's your goal? Yeah. Exactly. It should become a Pavlovian response at this point. Whenever I ask you any econ question, your goal is to make money. You know, doing legal mathematics is... Uh, um, so you own a movie theater, you want to make money. How do you make money in a movie theater? Tickets. You sell tickets. What else? Food. Food. So now you have to work. Maybe different movies uh, generate different sales. So I know this is recorded, but you know maybe the elderly are not as likely to buy food in the concession stand as teenage boys. And so you have to decide, would you rather have a movie with a smaller crowd that's more likely to pay at the concession stand? You also have to negotiate contracts with the uh, companies to, to screen a movie. Depending on how long the movie's been out, you have to pay more money to the owner. So when a movie first comes out, very little of the ticket sales goes to you. As time passes, you get more, but fewer people go to see it. A lot of movie theaters chose not to show George Lucas's Phantom Menace, not because they knew it would be a bad movie, Sorry, I just but because the demands Lucas put on them was too much, is he wanted them to commit to showing it on their best screens with a certain level of sound for a certain number of weeks. And they thought that you know, while it would bring in money and people in the beginning, in those later weeks they would be losing money that they could have made from other things. So let's let X is going to be 1 if Time T movie M starts on screen S and zero otherwise. So this is what's known as a binary indicator variable. It takes on the values zero and one. So there's a lot of parameters for movies that we'll have to you know, bring into the conversation as we start to talk. But so, this is a really good choice. It's basically my on or off. At time t, movie M starts playing on screen S, or it doesn't. Instead of movies, this could very easily be a plane taking off. And then you might have the plane is going from one city to another. So instead of having a screen, I would have city one, city two. You can have oil being shipped from a refinery to a city. This framework handles a huge variety of problems. So the question is, what kind of constraints do you think you would have for a movie theater? So we have lots of different constraints. And I want you to just see right now that we can make one or two of them very easily expressed in our linear environment. So don't worry about getting the math right, just tell me what kind of constraints would you have? The number of screens in the movie theater. Okay. And so how would that affect, say, showing movies? Then there's a maximum of that. Okay, we, we can't have more movies showing than screens. Yes. So at time t, I would say, like, 
the maximum amount of energy. Good. So at time t, we'll just do one constraint today. At time t, at most, one movie can be playing on a screen. Right? At time t, at most, one movie on screen s. So I need to introduce some notation. I need the runtime for movie. So let Rm equal the runtime for the movie. And maybe we'll do units of five minutes. So you know, if you're running a movie theater, you'll probably break things up into five or ten minute blocks in the day. You know, you're not going to do things on a minute. Right? Movie theaters, movies start at you know, 9 o'clock, 9.05, whatever. Not 9.03, 15. Now the one time might include cleanup time as well. And the cleanup time could depend on the movie, right? You're the movie with the little teenage boys, or the younger boys, or any boy. Could take a little bit longer to clean up than the movie with the old people. So what we would want is, for all screens, we want the sum over all movies, so M will be in the set of movies, and then we want a sum, so we have to think how we want to do this. Um, so, P goes so instead of having time with little team, we have time with big team. I might be off by one here, but basically, if a movie is playing on screen T and it's movie M, it had to have started sometime in the last hour and minutes, or it couldn't be playing. Maybe I have a plus one here. I, don't know, I always figure if you have to add that plus one. But if I want the movie to be playing at time t, I had to have started it within at least this window. And if I look at x, t, m, s, so for each movie, I see if I've started that movie on screen s in the requisite time. If I have, then the movie's playing. If I haven't, the movie's not playing. What can you say about this sum? What's our constraint? Well, no. I mean, if it's zero, we're fine. So I want, my constraint is, at most one movie is on screen as at a given time. So what can I say about this expression? Less than one equal to n. Not less than equal to n. I want this sum to be something. What do I want this sum to be? So let's think what this is telling me. Mm -hmm. For each movie, mm -hmm. this tells me if that movie has been started and is playing on screen as at time big T. And so every time I start the movie M on screen as within this time frame, I get an extra plus one. And I want it to be playing, at most one movie to be playing on screen S. How large can the sum be? Is it one? At one, exactly. The sum can't be larger than 1. That's my first constraint. If I force the sum to be 1, well, since each of these terms is either a 0 or a 1, at most one of these is non-zero, which means at most one movie is playing. So this is how you would encode a constraint like this very nicely into this, into this system. You can do other constraints, such as you know, a given movie should not be shown on two different screens at the same time. There is one way to violate that. How many of you have seen you know, Lord of the Rings in the theaters? Well, if you had to describe Lord of the Rings in one word, what would you describe it as? Long. Long. That's the word I would use. Right? It's long. Right? So long that you might actually have two discs for the movie. Ah, if you have two discs, you could start the first disc, have the first disc playing, have the second disc ready, switch to the second disc, and free up the first disc and then move that disc to another screen while the second disc is running. So there may be some times when you're allowed to have the same movie being shown on two screens, but typically you will not be able to do that. 
you know, a movie would be confined to, two, to one screen. So a nice question would be, come up with a similar formulation so that each movie is only being shown on at most one screen at a given time. So we'll talk about this in great detail. You know, the point of today's lecture was to just you know, motivate and introduce why we're studying the new program. And so I'm going to end the day with a math riddle. And there's many ways to solve this riddle. So due to the severe economic crisis, one, two, three, four, we can no longer afford to have an eight by eight chessboard. Times are just too tough. We have a five by five chessboard. And we have five queens. And we have three pawns. And what we want to do is we want to place the five queens on the board in such a way that three pawns can be safely placed. So for instance, I could do the following. Basically thinking, well, if I plug everything maybe in one corner, maybe they'll have so much overlap in the squares they attack that I'll be able to place the pawn safely. Can you explain the rule between queen and the first? Oh, so, so a, queen, a queen can attack di uh, vertically, horizontally, or diagonally. Oh, okay. And so the question is, which squares do the queens attack? Which squares do the queens not attack? And so, for instance, this queen attacks this square and this square. It attacks this square, this square, this square, and this square. And then diagonally it attacks this square and this square. These queens here will kill off all of these squares. This one diagonally kills this square and this square. These two diagonally kill these two squares. This queen kills this square. So I can only place one pawn safer. Oh, good. Okay, so. If I've chosen it like this, it looks like no square is safe. Yes. So no pawns can safely be placed. All right. So the question is, how do you position the five queens so that three pawns can be safely placed? If you haven't figured it out by now, I really do not care how to place five pawns on a board such as three. I'm sorry, five queens on a board so that three pawns are safe. I really don't care. The mathematics behind this, the vantage point, is actually one of the most important ideas in the new program. And so we'll talk about the solution of this later. Alright, so this basically gives you an idea of where we're going in this course, what kind of problems we're going to solve. I've talked to some people uh, in information technology in the library here about what linear programming environments we have at our disposal. And we should actually be able to implement some of these programs and solve them. You can do this in Excel, you can do this in, I think, R, then you can do this in other situations as well. This is a great skill to get on your you know, CV, that you can solve optimization problems like this. I know some of you have been looking at optimization problems, actually, this might be enough. Um.